Hello everyone. I very briefly wanted to talk about uh, sample selection in scattering. Now, we often get uh, very strange samples uh, sent to us. This, these samples can be anything really. Uh, we've had uh, 3D printed nanocomposites. Uh, we had titania, nanoparticles, uh, stuff in solutions, in particular metal salts or metal oxide salts. Um, we had DNA, we had uh, some viruses, um, so we get, we get all kinds of samples and some samples are easy to measure in our system, some samples are not easy to measure in our system and some samples are not really suitable for our system. They might need, um, uh, they might need a different instrument or they're not suitable for scattering at all. So how do you find out which sample is what? Well, you could of course just measure your sample and see if you want to um, uh, see if you can see any signal. Um, but I'd like to know whether or not my experiments are going to work before I spend a lot of time uh, trying to set it up. So I've created a small flowchart uh, that will help you um, to understand how uh, how you should select your sample, how samples can be adjusted for the technique, and how you can select. Uh, or find out whether the instrument that you had in mind is actually suitable for your sample. So this is the flowchart. Don't worry, I will go through this in bits uh, and I will tell you a little bit uh, about every step along the way. So, first of all, what you do uh, when you want to do a small angle scattering uh, experiment is to find out a couple of things. Two things. One is instrumental. What are the energies that the instrument can use. Um, this is both for laboratory instruments, they might have just one x-ray source with one energy uh, of x-rays that come out, but also for synchrotrons. Uh, synchrotrons can be set up um, for particular energies or can be uh, variable in energy, but they might each have their, um, have their sort of strong energy regions uh, which you might want to exploit. Second thing you need to know is your sample composition. What uh, atoms, what atoms, what uh, uh, atomic composition do do the phases have that you have in your sample? Um, this doesn't need to be very precise, but you need an approximate idea of how much, for example, platinum do I have in my in my sample? How much um, uh, maybe fluorescing elements like copper or zinc? Uh, do I have in there? So, armed with that information, uh, you can then uh, move on to the next step. First thing you want to do is to find out if you will have a problem with fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is when uh, you excite uh, atoms of a particular element in your sample um, and they relax uh, emitting radiation in all directions. This increases uh, the background level of your measurement and might make it impossible for you to get a good uh, scattering signal out. So if you've looked at your sample composition and, you've, uh, uh, and you think this might be a problem, try to find out if you can adjust the energy. So in our laboratory instrument we have two energies available. We have uh, copper energy, which is the most intense source that we have, um, but we also have molybdenum energy available. This might be useful for you if you have things like iron in your sample, which fluoresces uh, quite a lot uh, with copper and also absorbs very strongly with copper. Um, talk about that later. Uh, or if you have, um, yeah. Uh, so for elements like that, it might be useful to switch to a different energy. If that's possible, change the energy and check if the fluorescence is a problem again then. Uh, if you cannot adjust the energy and fluorescence is a problem for you, then find another instrument. There are beamlines available where you can freely select, uh, or almost freely select, energy uh, that you need for your experiment. Second thing to check is absorption. If you know the approximate composition and the approximate density of your sample, you can estimate uh, for a given thickness of sample how much of the x-ray beam will be absorbed. You typically don't want this. Um, you typically want to uh, uh, to have this between, say, uh, ten percent and ninety percent absorption. Any more than that, and you might have trouble. 
um, for a variety of reasons. But you know, if you don't get any X-rays through your sample, you can't actually see any scattering because it will all be absorbed. So, if you get, if you think you have an absorption problem problem in your sample, then find out if you can adjust the thickness of your sample. For example, thinning down your sample is a very good way of um, of reducing the X-ray absorption. Um, if you're working with uh, solutions or with, uh, with dispersions like epoxies, you might be able to adjust the concentration. Uh, so if you have, for example, um, uh, iron oxide particles in a plastic resin uh, you, and you reduce the concentration of these iron oxide particles, you greatly reduce the amount of X-ray absorption that you have. If you can do that, um, fine, uh, then you've solved your problem. If you cannot adjust the thickness or concentration, uh, go back one step and see if you can adjust the energy. If you increase the energy of the x-rays that you use, you will be able to get through more material. Um, or in other words, if you increase the energy, uh, the x-ray absorption by your sample is going to be reduced. Um, and then you basically come back in that same loop. Uh, then you can go to the next step if you've solved your absorption problem or if absorption is not a problem for you. Uh, so you want to find out whether you will have a good signal to background ratio. How do you find out? Well, you can characterize the background of, your uh, of the instrument you're planning to use uh, in absolute units. And by knowing what your sample looks like or what you expect from your scattering, you can already calculate how much scattering you're going to see. Uh, and that will help you in the long run uh, quite a bit. Um, even before the experiment, it is quite valuable to just calculate what kind of what kind and how much um, scattering you expect. Um, if you don't have enough scattering, you know, try to adjust the concentration. If you can increase the concentration, you can increase the amount of scattering that you see, or increase the thickness so that you get more, uh, more scattering over your background. Uh, and that basically leads you into the into the same uh, uh, sequence again. Um, lastly, you want to check whether the time scale of the measurement is okay for your sample stability. Well, in our laboratory instrument, we typically take about four to eight hours per sample. If you have a sample which um, which sediments, for example, or which deteriorates over that amount of time, or if you want to measure scattering from um, from sample developments over time that happen on a short time scale, for example, you're looking at a at a at a particle growth in a reaction, then the laboratory instrument is not the correct instrument for you. You will want to go to a beam line in that case. Um, and again, you know that's perfectly okay. Uh, there, um, there's a high chance that there will be an instrument suited to your particular need. Uh, so it is up to you to find the best instrument for your experiment um, and you know, basically pick the best tool for the job. So if you consider that uh, if you've considered that time skill and you think it's not a problem for your samples then go ahead. Uh, you're good to go. You can actually do your measurements or you have a high likelihood of success with uh, measurements of that sample in our instrument. So hopefully we'll see you then. Bye!